My, our next speaker is a personal friend of mine. I've known him since we both went to Cass Tech High School in the 1960s. Um, he's, I venture to say, a little bit more down to earth than the previous speaker, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, hearing what Dwayne has to say. Uh, please welcome Dwayne Hendricks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, let me talk while uh, we're making the transition here. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and uh, I am also a native Detroiter. Uh, I went to Cass Technical High School, which is where Stuart and I went uh, many moons ago. Um, and what I want to do in this talk is, I knew Fuller, and uh, you heard Bill Becker and his experiences, and what we were trying to do with this session is to take a couple of people that work with Fuller and, in different ways and show the breadth and the depth of what he did and his contributions. So, um, my take is, um, it's can't do, okay. now, go past the numbers. Excuse me. There it is. on transitions, at least, uh, what can I say? Um, I titled this thing My Journey Through Space and Time because um, what I'm trying to do here is to say, take certain icons in my life that represented sort of key aha or eureka moments to me and show how I, they, they came together later on. And that, you know, you've seen this yourself where something happens at one point in your life and you sort of, it's an isolated event. And then later on, something happens that ties it back together. So what I want to do is go through that flow in my life and how it related to, to things that Fuller did. Okay, so that's the uh, the goal here. So uh, Bill showed you a picture of the Fort Rotunda. Uh, my view of the Rotunda is a bit different in that um, uh, when I was in elementary school, one of the things we did here in the city was make a pilgrimage to the Fort Rotunda. It was a big deal. And then given the roads at the time, to get to the rotunda out here in Dearborn was a day trek, a day to get there and back. And uh, I mean, everybody was gone, so we did it in elementary school, get a bus, go out there. And I remember to this day seeing this thing and going inside. And here's another view of the rotunda, the dome inside. And you go inside this thing and uh, you go, and there was this very long escalator that went to the top of the dome. And when you get up there and you look down, it's like, it's just breathtaking. I can see it in my mind's eye right now. And I remember the time, who did this? You know, at the time. That's so what I thought, who did this? This is just remarkable. So um, that stuck with me and it still sticks with me today. And uh, uh, if you mentioned the rotunda to contemporaries of me, you just get this sort of, like, oh yeah, Rotunda, yeah, because everybody in Detroit knew about the Rotunda and had gone there at one point in their life. Sadly, it burned down in the just before Christmas in 1962. But during its heyday, it was the fifth most uh, frequented tourist attraction in the United States before the Rotunda. The fifth, number five. Remarkable, and it's never been recreated here. But this is important in terms of Detroit history because this thing really captivated the populace at that time. Okay, moving on to amateur radio. This is like getting into the, uh, the uh, early 60s. I had a friend in, amateur, uh, in elementary school whose father was an amateur radio operator. 
and he took me down to his father's basement and had his ham shack. So I saw this equipment and I said, wow, this is neat. And I saw him operate and talk to all these different places in the world. And I wanted to do this. So I got my amateur radio license when I was 12 years old. And from that point on in my life, I've been used to being able to talk to anywhere on the planet that I wanted to, anytime I wanted to. You know, that was what the technology allowed you to do. So it changed my worldview. And it gave me a different sense of uh, awareness of what is possible. So one of the things that stuck with me in my life is the art of the possible. If you know something's possible, it changes everything. And let's face it, um, we all use wireless. You know, you use it on your cell phones, uh, television, radio. But let's face it, wireless is the closest technology we have to magic. Because we all use it, but we have no idea how it works. How do we use this technology to go to communicate to Mars, for instance? Okay. So, um, by luck, I was able to get involved with this technology and become fairly good at it you know, over the years. And think about this in terms of your own experiences, in terms of like the event horizon of your lives, and that you're used to an event horizon of immediacy, and that you're used to things happening that happen you know, like that. You see it, it happens. But when you start working with technologies like wireless, or that doesn't work anymore because even going 10 miles, the time it takes to speed a light or a radio wave to propagate 10 miles is significant. It's measurable. And you have to take it into account when you work with it. So by getting involved in, with wireless, I, my event horizon changed to be something different than what you're used to. So, uh, but here's the thing. If you think about what happens in your everyday lives, you do see things all the time that uh, uh, force themselves to sort of make you reconsider this notion of immediacy. Because whenever the sun is dawn, which there are a lot of in this area, then uh, you see a lightning strike, and then sometime later you hear the sound. So you learn, if you think about it, the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. So again, your, your event horizon is sort of what you want it to be or what you forget it is. Okay? And this is important when you're starting to consider things like the art of the possible. The next milestone in my career was um, fall of 68. The whole earth catalog came out. Now, Bill mentioned this, and this first edition is called Access to Tools. You can't make that out, but it's Whole Earth Catalog, Access to Tools. This, you've heard of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. At the time, this is the functional equivalent, and that man is a tool maker. He excels at making tools that do all kinds of things. So what the Whole Earth Catalog did was put in one place a whole parcel of tools. Okay, so you could do, you know, find the tools and then go and do things with these tools. Two things I found in the catalog that fascinated me. Bucky Fuller, Bucky Fuller was profiled in this first edition of the catalog. And in fact, you could sort of say it was mostly about Bucky and what he had done. The second thing was something called psychohistory. Now, these two things, Fuller awakened in me a appreciation of geometry, which at that point I didn't have. You know, I went through it in school and it was like, what is this stuff? What do you do with it? And mathematics, which the psychohistory did. So let me say a few things about psychohistory before I segue back into Fuller. Uh, there was a famous writer named Isaac Asimov. He did fiction and uh, science fiction, um, and he created a science fiction series called The Foundations trilogy, which has been voted the most famous or popular science fiction series of all time, in terms of the Yugo War. And the Foundation trilogy is about a guy named Harry Selden, who's a mathematician, who develops psychohistory, which is a way of 
predicting the behavior of large groups of people through time. And using this discipline, he predicts that the galactic empire is going to collapse. And the collapse is going to be last for thousands of years. And so he develops something called the Selden Plan, which allows this collapse to um, essentially only take uh, about a thousand years into 10,000 years. And, uh, and that's what the trilogy is about. So I fell in love with that trilogy. And uh, so when the whole Earth catalog came out, I found out that there really was a field called psychohistory and it wasn't just science fiction. And there was this dude named Nicholas Ryshevsky who wrote a book called Looking at History Through Mathematics on the MIT Press um, that essentially detailed a math, the, the, the basic math which is known as psychohistory. I also found out that Sigmund Freud was uh, the father of that field and that he actually did work in that using psychoanalytic techniques and then another psychologist by the name of Eric Erickson continued that work and it became what the academic field of psychohistory is. And Ryshevsky essentially recast it in, in, in terms of using mathematics. Okay, so enough about that, but um, back to Fuller. So we're in the uh, fall of 68, and so I had this eureka moment with psychohistory and uh, geometry and Fuller and this thing called the World Game, which Bill mentioned earlier in his talk. Now, the World Game is a way of, that Fuller developed to teach people how to do what he did, okay? He has this, uh, what he does or did, he called it comprehensive anticipatory design science. So if you play the game, you learn to become a practitioner of comprehensive anticipatory design science. And what you see up there is for using the Dymaxian map. The Dymaxian map is something he developed that you're all familiar, say, with the Mercator projection. And the thing about the Mercator projection and some of the other projections is that they distort the, uh, the size of the land mass relative to other land mass, masses, and you get a distorted view of the world. But what Fuller felt was important was to come up with a way to show the Earth without distortion, or the land masses without distortion. And that's what the Dymaxian map did. And that was the basic framework or tool he used to play the game. So, comprehensive, what it meant to Fuller was uh, looking at everything, holistic, in that he, he would say that the nature doesn't have a department of agriculture, okay, and a department of water. I mean, it's all together. Okay? So, he instilled in people that worked with him this notion that look at the whole and not the parts. And that modern science, or we're taught, is basically about reductionism, okay, breaking things into small pieces. And he rejected that. Says, look, you got to do, you got to look at the holes, and that's hard to do. But that's why you know it gets ignored, and, and but you really got to work at it. Anticipatory. Look to the future. Don't design stuff for the now, because you know something's going to come and bite you in the ass essentially if you don't look for it. And so that's what the anticipatory is about. Design, use um, a set of principles that um, make sense, okay? And that, that's a sort of umbrella, the, 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 the D, but followed by S. And that science is, if you look at what science is, it's a craft. It's basically an agreement by a community to, to a set of rules, okay? In the internet community, which I'm a part of, we have this saying that we believe in rough consensus and running code. And that's just another way of talking about what science is about, in that there is a common agreed upon framework about how things are. And it's not, you know, on stone tablets, it's a way of dealing with the world we find ourselves in, and it keeps changing. And that's an important aspect of that, it changes. So like I said, from the internet, it's rough consensus, rough, and running code, 
Code works. Okay? You can point to it and it works. In science, you make predictions, you build a theory, and you use that theory to make predictions. And if your theory is correct, then it will be able to predict real world events. Okay. So let me go back to this. In the summer of 1970, which turns out to be 40 years ago, I heard about Fuller was going to be holding a World Game workshop in Carbondale, Illinois. So I went there and spent the summer in Carbondale, Illinois at Southern Illinois University doing the game. That's where I met Fuller for the first time. He went to SIU in uh, 1959 and became a university professor there and created a department called the Design Department. And the Design Department was hosting this game. So what we did and how we played the game, we did it in a geodesic dome. There were two geodesic domes at the time on the Carbondale campus. And so it's the place. It's important in terms of, uh, at the time, that you play the game in this sort of uh, the dome because when you went into the dome, it like expanded your consciousness to something that's like, whoa, what is this? We're, we're in this structure where if you can stand on one side of it, you can whisper and it can be heard on the other side. So you learned about the acoustics. And then you were hit with this Dymaxian map in that we had all been brought up with the Mercator projection. And then here's this new map that you've never seen before. And it's like, wow. So what it did for the 50 people that showed up for this workshop is it pulled the top of our heads off and made uh, us all pliable to have new concepts dumped in, okay, before our heads got screwed back on again. So what we did in playing the game was, uh, and I will show you some of this, where you go out and get lots of data for things, like where's the oil, how much is it, uh, how is it going to be depleted over time, and then what we would do was display that information on the Dynastian maps. And that was a lot of hard work because we had to go to the library, go through microfiche, and dig up all this stuff. Fuller had a, what he called the World Resource Inventory, and he had at his office um, index cards, two by five cards, where he had put all these facts that he had started uh, um, uh, uh, cataloging and putting together back in the 1930s. So we would augment all that material that he had collected and, and put it on these maps. Now, what we brought to the table is that humans are great pattern matchers. Our intuitive sense is based on essentially learning to um, find patterns in our environment. Now, we're not taught this, okay? But I think as I say this, you sort of intuitively sense it, that this, the sixth sense, you know, that sort of thing, is really about matching patterns and being able to make sense out of patterns that you see out there in your environment. So by putting all this information in the map and then looking at it, you know, we could essentially project and integrate uh, the information and uh, that's, that's essentially a way that you do comprehensive anticipatory design science. Right. So you see, that's it was his way to help people learn to do what he did in this particular problem domain. And that's what the world game is useful for. Now, that summer, and Bill showed you some of the, uh, one of the graphs where it shows population and fossil fuels. Well, we did a, set, a number of projections uh, after that summer that showed, and there were a lot of future-oriented groups at the time. There was something called the Institute for the Future, which was formed in 68, which still exists in Palo Alto, California. And ah, they were predicting that about this time, 2000, 2010, we were going to be in serious, we were going to be in big trouble. Okay? And that's what we came up with in that summer of 1970, and that a lot of resources were going to be depleted, and uh, there would be wars for resources and things like that. Okay. Now, I participated last year in a reboot of the world game down in San Diego, California. And what you see here 
is the environment that we created to do this, and that on the floor is a, a, is a huge dimaximum map that stretched the length and breadth of this building that we were in, and so you could walk on the map and essentially walk the planet. And we would put uh, like small barrels that represented oil on the map or other icons that would represent various resources, and we could move them around. So this was a way that we didn't uh, have available to us back in uh, 1970 to play with the resources on the map. And we had a team of, uh, again, about 50 people, and we had computers, and we had the Google, and all this stuff, and so this was a three-day workshop. It wasn't an entire summer. And we were able to get together and bond and learn comprehensive participatory design science because some of us were there that had done the game 40 years ago. So we could help the people get into it. And what we found was that in eventually a half a day, um, everybody had come up to speed and bonded. And for the rest of the three-day period, we were all doing useful work. So at the end of the three days, we basically validated the predictions that we came up with 40 years ago and that we're in deep trouble. So, what the game is about is not just being able to say we're in trouble or we're not in trouble. It's about trying to make, as Fuller would say, uh, the world work for 100% of humanity. So, to apply comprehensive CADS is that you now use the game to come up with solutions. So what you saw Bill Becker do with what he's doing, with his work, okay, a renewable energy, sustainable power, is just that. And that we can solve these problems if we get about it and let ourselves do so, okay, if we play the game. So there's one book that Fuller wrote. If you want to get involved and, and, and get a sense of Fuller, there's a quick a book that you can, it's a quick read, it's called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And pick it up, and it will introduce you to CADS. Highly recommend it. So, I'm going to close with wireless, and I'm going to lose an eye. I don't, I'm, I'm going to close right now and see if I have any questions. So, lights up. Lights up. Anybody have any questions? Maybe you should talk about wireless. So, um, how, do you, how do you get involved in the world game? Like, what does it take to participate? Um, go to uh, there's a website WRSC World Resource Simulation Center dot org WRSC dot org. And that's a good entry point in that we're trying to come up with a way so you can play the game online and also do it uh, like as a seminar at a particular place. Next question. Uh, I was going to ask you, can, can you play it on a scale smaller than the world, like the scale of Detroit or Michigan? Um, the team that uh, helped do this game in San Diego last year, next month, since we're in, uh, we're in August now, in September, is going to do it for uh, the state of California. Okay. So yes, you can do it for something other than the entire planet. The, the techniques, in fact, we, we did a San Diego simulation as part of this uh, uh, workshop I mentioned in 2009. Um, all, all of Buckminster Fuller's books refer to the politics that, uh, that stop everything. It's the same the stuff that's going on today. Okay, a lot of the new entrepreneurs that are out there too are looking at just one little niche for their inventions or whatever. They're not looking at the at the widespread of what it applies to and you know the problem solving techniques. I think Buckminster's best book that I've ever read was the one called Buckminster Fuller, I seem to be a bird. I agree, that, but that's, that's a tough read, okay, because, you know, one of the things about Fuller is he's developed his own language, or did you find it to be a tough read? No, it was, it was a lighthearted version, you've got to take it a lighthearted Okay, all right. 
I seem to be a verb. Check that one out. Any other questions? Well, do you want to tell us about wireless infrastructure for two minutes? Okay. Um, so, where I took what I learned from Fuller was into the wireless domain in that uh, uh, I deploy wireless infrastructure all over the world. And Wired Magazine did a profile on me in 2002 and tagged me as the broadband cowboy. Now, I tried to live this down because you see a cowboy hat, you see boots, you know. I don't know where these guys get this stuff, but I'm the broadband cowboy. So, um, wireless, like I said, is magical, and it allows you to do infrastructure where, like that, okay. And there's a lot of wireless being deployed outside this country, uh, where places where there's not going to be fiber and other types of wire to carry bits. All right, they just won't because of various issues, cultural and economic. So, um, and then look at Detroit now. <laughs> there's a lot of wire that's disappearing from the city. So maybe there's an opportunity here to do something unique with wireless to provide a communications fabric to enable a lot of innovation in entrepreneurism, okay? I'm moving back here, and I'm going to complete my move uh, here in August, and uh, I'm going to be looking into how to do that, okay? Because um, uh, it's what I do. Well, thank you very much, Glenn.